bipolar is I have manic episodes where I feel like I'm on top of the world, I can do anything, I have all this great energy, and then I fall into depressed episodes. Mm -hmm. And I feel hopeless, despair, negative thoughts, I'm worthless. You know, it's not saying mental illness and poverty and anguish lead to violence because we all are responsible for our own actions, right? right. And he turns to violence. That's Arthur Fleck completely stepping into the Joker and just abandoning the Arthur Fleck persona, right? He's, he's gone. He's the Joker now, that's all he is. Hello, I'm licensed therapist Jonathan Decker and I love movies. What show is this? It's the greatest show. What do you mean what show is this? What are you talking Cinema about? therapy. Oh. Welcome to- <laughs> What did I say? You said, hello, I'm Jonathan Decker. <laughs> You know what this show is, you're already here. Hello and welcome to Cinema Therapy. I'm Jonathan Decker, licensed therapist. I love film. I am Alan Seawright, professional filmmaker, and I love and need therapy. All right, let's yeah. dance. You ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? What? Let's do it. So today we're doing something a little bit different. We had an idea, uh, the head writer of the show, who is my wife and I, we thought, what if you could take famous movie villains who, the most interesting ones are always damaged people who didn't necessarily need to turn out to be a villain. What would it be like if we could have gotten those people some help? Yeah. Would they have become villains? Could they, would they have turned to villainy or could we have helped them before they got could there? Could we have helped them before they got there or could we help them like rehabilitate out of it? The idea of villain therapy, we want to be very, very clear. We are not correlating mental illness with villainy. Oh, no, no, no. Because the simple fact is 95% of violent crimes, in our country at least, are committed by the non-mentally ill. 95% by people who are not mentally ill. And people who suffer from mental illness are 10 times as likely to be victims of violence. 10 times? 10 times. Wow. More likely to be victims of violence than perpetrators. So we want to destigmatize this right out of the gate. When we're talking about villain therapy, we're talking about how people arrive at a place of evil. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's mental illness as part of their story, but actually arriving at evil is about our innate capacity as people to do evil acts. So I think today's villain fits mm. quite neatly into that. Uh, definitely did not need to turn to villainy. Definitely has some mental illness that we awesome. need to talk about. So tell me about the patient. Who are we dealing with today? Well, today, my friend, we are dealing with someone who has had a lot of difficulty in their job. They're a, an aspiring stand-up comedian. Hello, it's good to be here. <laughs> and moonlighting as a clown for hire. Living in poverty with their mother, even though he's middle-aged. I'm pretty sure I know who this is. You, yeah, I'm sure you've already figured it out. <laughs> Star-Lord. Who? If you haven't seen the film in question, and you either don't care if it's spoiled, or you should probably stop and go watch the film, because we're getting into spoiler we're, territory. We're getting into some spoiler territory here. He doesn't originally know this, but his mother, who also has mental illness, claims that he is her biological son by a sort of business magnate in the city, a very famous person. It's Thomas Wayne, well. <laughs> allows her boyfriend to viciously abuse both her and her son. He experiences some severe head trauma and has no conscious memories okay. of this. She is hospitalized, diagnosed with psychosis. He is bullied for his sweet, innocent personality and mental illness. I like you, Arthur. You know, a lot of the guys, they think you're a freak, but I like you. The crowds at his comedy shows heckle him. Uh, he suffers physical violence from strangers. He is just in a world of hurt. Real crappy life. Real, just really sad. Yeah. Really, really sad life. He goes to a social worker for therapy, but due to budget cuts in the city, the social worker no longer has time for him. He can't get his medication anymore. He can't get therapy anymore because he can't afford it. And, you know, across the film, things go from bad to worse mm -hmm. for him until he finally turns to violence and in an outburst of violence, finds some amount of catharsis, it seems. Right. So we're dealing with Arthur Fleck. You are correct, sir. It is yeah. Arthur Fleck, the Joker, yeah. from the 2019 film, Joker. What a film, by the way. Wow. Fascinating, <laughs> absolutely mind blowing. I don't want to say I enjoyed the film because it's not enjoyable. Yeah, it's not a fun it, and movie. and it's not meant to be. It's not meant to be. No, it's what it is is effective and fascinating. Yeah, it is a brilliantly made film in a way that I just was not expecting from the guy who made the Hangover movies. Right in the nuts, 
Yes, that was beautiful. <laughs> If I'm no. being honest. And I mean, I'd, I'd read a lot, I'd read up on it. it. Actually, I saw it after it had been out for some time. And so I'd read a lot of people saying, Joaquin is great, but the film's not that great. Like that was a lot of what I read about. I completely disagree as a film fan. I mean, we'll yeah. talk about my thoughts on it as a therapist in a second. But as a film fan, I thought the filmmaking was phenomenal. I thought the, the scripting was fantastic. And they say, well, it's a ripoff of Taxi Driver and King of Comedy. I thought it was ironic. Tarantino was saying, is this what we're doing now? We're recycling movies from the 70s? And I'm like, Tarantino, you don't get really? to say that, man. Seriously. <laughs> Mr. I recycle everything. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I mean, no, Tarantino's talented, but. Oh, he's brilliant. He's the best recycler of 70s cinema that there is. I'm a very optimistic, happy person. Mm -hmm. This film doesn't fit into my personality. Nope. And I loved it. It's so good. It's just so well made. It's but so good. As a therapist, looking at it as a therapist, a lot of the conversation in my community about this is the portrayal of mental illness right. in the film. There's a lot of division. Some people say it's a very compassionate look at what it, it's like to live with all these symptoms, the the torment and the anguish and the confusion, as well as just not having a place to fit in mm -hmm. because people don't understand it. So they want you just to act normal. Right. And so there's a lot of compassion towards mental illness, but then others are saying, well, there's danger here because you could interpret it as... As stigmatizing, right? As stigmatizing because yeah. he does become a killer. And how many people fear those who struggle with mental illness because they're afraid of violence and the horror stories and things like that. And so here's what this film is. What this film is, is a call for kindness and compassion for the mentally ill. What it is not is a boogeyman story of, and a cautionary tale of if you are unkind, they will snap and kill you. Yeah. And granted, it could have been clearer on that point. And in my opinion, the way to watch this film, I know this is gonna sound pretentious, but I have no other way to say this. The best way to watch this film is to recognize it's fiction, yep. to recognize it's it's a very gritty, grounded take, but it's still based on a comic book villain, mm -hmm. and that it is not saying causality, you know, it's not saying mental illness and poverty and anguish lead to violence, because we all are responsible for our own actions, right? right. And he turns to violence. I also read, uh, there's a very strong political component in this that's, yeah. you know, calling out, like, if we don't fund as a society mental health programs, mm -hmm. this is a possible result, right? It's not a right. one-to-one, -one, this will happen, it's this is a thing that could happen and it is bad. Yeah, well, and so I wanna speak on that because we're, we're, an, we're an apolitical show, we're not political at all, right. but I wanna speak on that as a therapist. I have I spent several years working at a community mental health clinic for people who were on Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And I, I know a lot of people who are against any sort of public funding of health programs, and I'll tell you this right now, like. These people can't afford it on their own. Right. And a, a lot of people, they can't either get and keep employment or the employment that they get isn't going to be able to cover their health care. Yeah. Right? And so there isn't, there's a component of this that you could see it as political. Um, I see it as humanitarian. It's moral, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a moral. Yeah. And so we have a breakdown of the system that fails Arthur and that contributes to the cocktail, everything that goes wrong, right? Yeah. So let's talk about Arthur's uh, symptoms. What, what's he got going on? We talked about his history, but in order for me to diagnose and treat, I need to know what are the symptoms that he's showing. Well, let me give you the symptoms as far as I read them. Okay. Uh, so he's got his uncontrolled outbursts of laughter <laughs> and crying almost fits. Yeah. It's, it's almost like a, like a tick. Mm -hmm. He creates an alternate reality which he believes is real. I don't know if that's a psychosis or what that, I'm sure you'll be able to diagnose with, better. With the neighbor, right? With the neighbor, he has he has fantasies or an alternate reality in which she's dating him and is supporting and compassionate yeah. because she was kind of nice to him once on an elevator. Right, uh, but in his head, they have a whole relationship. Yeah, and that's all portrayed in the film as this brilliant, unreliable narrator stuff Yeah. that for a while you think is real, and then it's like, wait, but it's not, oh man film is so good. Well, what's so cool about it is they portray, they don't say this is all in his head. Like they, I mean, they do later mm -hmm. when he like, he faces the reality that she doesn't really know who he is. Right. And he doesn't have the right to come in her apartment as a boyfriend would and hang out. Yeah. And she's terrified that he's there. And then he's like, oh, this is. Well, and then they leave ambiguous how he gets out of there. We don't know what happened to her, which is chilling to me. That's the most frightening part of the film to me mm. is we don't know what happened to her. 
Yeah. Did he leave or did something happen and then he left? Well, and my, my thinking is that he didn't hurt her because we see other areas where he, he shows compassion. Or he, he targets and kills specific people who were bullies or mean to him and he lets other people live. But we don't know what's real and what's not. Right. How much of this is, is in his head versus how much of it actually happened? I mean, for all we know, this could be like that Buffy the Vampire Slayer episode where she's in a mental hospital and her entire career as a vampire slayer is yeah. all just in her head. Like, in her head. For all we know, like all this stuff didn't happen or some of it happened and some of it didn't or it may have happened differently. Yeah. He may have he may have killed her. Yeah. Or he may have just left. Like we don't she know. She may happened. not have existed. We she... don't know. <laughs> it's all <laughs> But that's that's anyway. that's one thing that's so brilliant about this movie is you actually experience what it's like to feel insane. Yeah. To feel madness and not know what's real, right? I, I had a brilliant. It's so I had well a, done. I had a training one time on schizophrenia where they sat another therapist across from me and we were and you're supposed to have a conversation while other therapists in the cohort are talking in your ears and sometimes they yell and sometimes they whisper and sometimes oh, that's they gotta just, be really fun. And sometimes they just make noise. And after five minutes of trying to have a conversation, like I was like I understand why people present as just wild and because I was like, Shut up! Shut up! Right, and watching this film is like that—not as unpleasant, but it does make it does make you feel like, oh, this is what it feels like to live with this. Because I don't know what's real, I don't know what actually happened or not, you know. And what's brilliant is, unlike *A Beautiful Mind*, which I think is a great film, Mm -hmm. but *A Beautiful Mind* ultimately like lays the cards on the table and says, "Here's what's real, here's what's not." And you watch *Joker*, and when it's done, you're like, "I say, hold up, wait a minute." Something ain't right. The contrast there is the Joker never comes to understand what is real and what's not. And even if he did, he doesn't care because he found the thing that he loves, which is violence. And John Nash is a good guy. Right. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know. Valid point. That's the the difference there. Uh, Okay, just a couple more symptoms and then we can get on to... The real, the good stuff, the treatment. Diagnosis see and treatment, what we can do. let's do it. Here we go. So, he also doesn't feel remorse for killing. In fact, he feels, yeah. it seems he feels liberated by it, yeah. which is very creepy. Um, <laughs> he has suicidal thoughts, negative hopeless thoughts and feelings, but then other times feels on top of the world, dances down the stairs, mm-hmm. you know, that whole that whole shtick. So, you know, there's, there's symptoms that to me read as depression, but then there's other stuff, so I'm maybe bipolar. I don't know. We'll let okay. you diagnose. Today's episode is brought to you by NordPass. NordPass is awesome. It is a password manager. It will store all your passwords. You can store secure documents and notes, and it all is within one vault that is managed by one master password. Jono, how are you doing with remembering all of your many, many passwords? My identity has been stolen so many times by this point that I am rebooting as Dr. Snack. <laughs> as Dr. Snack. Could have used you NordPass. And the reason why is because it helps you to stay safe online. NordPass recognizes suspicious websites so you don't accidentally reveal your sensitive information. It's also great for generating secure passwords. It'll make weird long alphanumeric strings that no human can remember. So hackers can't hack it, crackers can't crack it, crackers are a thing, and right? snackers can't snack it. <laughs> That's not... <laughs> You don't know much about computers, do you? Not at all. That's why I need NordPass. That's why you need NordPass. <laughs> Perfect. Check out our link in the description below. NordPass.com slash cinematherapy or use our code cinematherapy. You'll get 70% off plus one month free. Thank you, NordPass, for sponsoring our show. And uh, stay safe on the internet, people. Well, I've got a history. I've got symptoms. Yep. Let's diagnose Arthur Fleck. I'm going to give you that. Thank you. Let's diagnose Arthur Fleck. I'm going to open up my pretentious filmmaker notebook here. (laughs) It's got a book. A book of jokes. So I did a lot of research going into this episode because I wanted to get the psychology right. Because I do work with anxiety and I work with depression, but largely I work in relationships. And so I was I was reading up what every every psychiatrist, psychologist said about this film that I could find. And the one that I gel the closest with is Dr. Imani Walker who is a criminal psychiatrist. I mean, she works with... So she knows exactly what she's talking about. She works with people with mental illness who act out violently. So that that 5% that we're talking about, right? Right. She diagnosed Arthur with bipolar disorder, bipolar 1, most recent episode manic with psychotic features, and then something called pseudobulbar effect. So let's... let's Pseudobulbar effect. Pseudobulbar, yeah. Of course. Okay, so... 
uh, when it comes to bipolar, bipolar is I have manic episodes where I feel like I'm on top of the world. I can do anything. I have all this great energy. Nothing can stop me. And my, my silver linings playbook. Silver linings playbook. And my my reasoning is impaired by this exuberant hyper optimism. Yeah, everything's gonna go great no matter what I do. Yeah, to an unrealistic degree. Everything's gonna go great. Yeah. And those episodes tend to last days, weeks, or months, but they they last an extended period of time. And then I fall into depressed episodes, mm -hmm. and I feel hopeless, despair, negative thoughts. I'm worthless. My life isn't gonna amount to anything. And oftentimes, loss of interest in things I used to enjoy, suicidal tendencies, suicidal thoughts, self-harming behaviors can all be a part of that. So, do the depressive episodes in bipolar? Does it track with just regular clinical depression? Yeah, generally. Pretty I mean, much one to one. So what ends up what the major difference is between bipolar and major depressive disorder is if I have major depressive disorder, I have depressed episodes lasting days, weeks, or months. And then I come out of them and I feel kind of normal, just like normal. at a baseline. You and don't then I go, go back. bipolar. You yeah, just... and with bipolar I go I go into manic, right? That's bipolar one. Bipolar okay. two, you have something called hypomanic, which is like manic but uh, scaled down. Like that's that's the biggest difference. Okay. Right? So Arthur, throughout the film, we see him go from one place to the other. We see him go from manic to depressed and back again. He's actually entered into something called rapid cycling bipolar, hmm. which means that instead of lasting days, weeks, or months as in manic and days, weeks, and months in depressed, stress can like bring hours. on that. Yeah, that it, that happens across hours or shorter bursts of time. And so we see times where Arthur says to his therapist, all I have are negative thoughts. All I have are negative thoughts. Right. Right, and times where he's walking and he's clearly just moping and he's clearly, and uh, moping is a judgmental word, but he's clearly down and feeling hopeless, you know, where he wants to die and life is just miserable. And then we have times where he's like, I can get up on stage in front of a group of people and I can crush it. Everybody's telling me that my stand-up's ready for the big clubs. Even though he can't. He definitely cannot. <laughs> he definitely cannot. Yeah. And where he thinks, that beautiful girl down the hallway, even though I've probably never really had a relationship before, I live and I live with my mother and I have a hard time talking to strangers, I could totally sweep her off her feet. Mm -hmm. I can absolutely do that. And so he goes, he goes manic and depressed and manic and depressed. And so that happens more rapidly as the film goes on because he's under more and he's more stress. He's under more and more strain, yeah. Now, why most recent episode manic? Because if we're diagnosing him at the end of the film, once he kills his mom. Yep. He's manic for the rest of the film. He's manic for the rest of the film. He's dancing on the stairs. You know, that is, I mean. He's depressed in the cop car until the accident, and then he's the messiah of Armageddon? <laughs> I don't know, but he's loving it. Yeah, and so he goes from, I'm gonna go on Murray's show and I'm gonna kill myself to, I just killed my mom. I just outran the cops and started anarchy where the cops are getting torn apart. I mean, that is that is the confidence of a manic episode. That is a, I am totally in control and nothing can touch me. I'm gonna kill my coworker. Yep. I mean, he's gonna come over, I'm gonna murder him, and then I'm gonna tell the other one, hey, I'm gonna be on Murray Franklin's show tonight. I'm gonna be on tonight. <sighs> you should watch me on the show. I mean, I don't know why the, the buddy doesn't tell the police, hey, Here's who just killed this guy, and he's going to be on Murray Franklin's show. Like, that to me is a plot hole. But Arthur saying that and thinking that he's immune to the consequences of what just happened is, it's mania. Not all mania is that detached from reality, but for him it definitely is, right? Yeah. And so then he goes on the show, and instead of being afraid, he's dancing across the stage. He kisses, like, oh yeah, the Dr. Ruth stand-in. He gives her a big kiss. Big smooch. You know, like, he, he's just, like, on top of the world, nothing can touch me. Now, let's talk about the uh, psychotic feature. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes bipolar can manifest with hallucinations and delusions. So right. delusions are when you have a belief that is not based in reality and goes contrary to the evidence that is all around you. So he has delusions that his stand-up act is going to crush it, that audiences love him, that he's going to go on Murray Franklin's show and it's going to be a, a hit. And then he has these hallucinations we were talking about, which in his case is part of his bipolar, where he believes that his girlfriend is with him at the hospital. He'll open the door in full clown makeup and kiss her, and she'll be like, this is cool, I'm into this. Yeah. You know, like he, and all these things never happened. Now, let's, let's address this pseudo-bulbar effect. So pseudo-bulbar effect is, it's sudden intense fits of crying or laughter that are just completely out of control. It's crying and laughter that doesn't seem right for the situation. We see like when he's on the train and the guys are tormenting him. Yeah. It's such great acting. It's, I, I just have to say, Joaquin Phoenix playing this role is a revelation mm -hmm. as an actor. It is one of the best performances on film I've ever seen. I don't know 
what we've done to deserve two of the greatest film performances ever are both the same character. Right. Played completely different ways. Right. <laughs> but uh, no, it's his his performance is so incredible. What do you think performance wise about when he is laughing and crying at the same time and how does an actor even pull that off? I was watching and I'm like, I I don't know how he's doing this. How do you It is it is absolutely gut wrenching. I mean, as an actor, the best performance that you get as an actor is when you access something inside and you're just experiencing the real emotion, right? You can use tools and tricks and whatever and like <laughs> pretend and like fake an emotion, but to to really get it across on screen and make people believe it, you have to just actually experience the emotion. Yeah. Which is one of the things about acting that's so brilliant is and so hard is you have to be able to get yourself into an emotional state over and over and over again to do multiple takes and different angles and yeah. all kinds of stuff, right? Acting is one of the hardest jobs in the world. Granted, you get a trailer and people will bring you nuts whenever you ask for them. But uh, that's that is it. That is the pinnacle of. I would like some nuts, <laughs> I would please. Like some nuts, please. A bowl of, of nuts. All the, of all the perks of being a superstar, you pick. They bring nuts to your trailer, dude. Cashews. <laughs> Have you had cashews before? They're delicious. Please remove these from my presence. They aren't salty enough. These aren't. I asked. <laughs> I asked for shelled. Get that corn out of my face! <laughs> Pistachios. Anyway, he is such a method actor, Joaquin Phoenix, that I I don't know what he was doing to his brain, but he tricked his brain into doing that. Yeah. Because he wasn't pretending, he was doing it. Yeah. I don't know how he got there. I honestly don't. And that's that's the big magic trick of movies, is I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how he that's did brilliant. it. That's brilliant. So the bipolar is likely genetic, mm -hmm. but the pseudobulbar effect is actually caused by the damage to the prefrontal cortex. And we learn in the film that he suffered a traumatic head injury when his mom's boyfriend was abusive. You also stood by one of your boyfriends repeatedly abused your adopted son and battered you. This is part of why he snaps and kills his mom is he realizes he doesn't know why he's had these struggles all of his life and it's because she failed to protect him. Yeah. Right? Now, I would add that it seems, out of the gate, it seems like he has antisocial personality disorder. After all, all the symptoms are there. There's deceitfulness. He tries to get the file on his mom. He shows reckless disregard for the safety of others when he brings the gun to the children's hospital. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, the biggest one is that he shows no remorse for hurting the people that he hurts. Right. Well, let me get this straight. You think that killing those guys is funny? I do. And I'm tired of pretending it's not. The reason I wouldn't diagnose him with antisocial personality disorder is because those symptoms can actually pop up with bipolar sometimes, and I would probably fold them in with Just that in his case. Yeah, put it in with the bipolar. Stepping away from um, the psychology of it and going into the family therapy aspect, his relationship with his mom is codependent. She needs him and he needs to be needed. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is it's actually keeping him from flourishing, becoming more independent because, yes, I mean, he has clown gigs and stuff, but how much time does he spend at home because she can't be alone? And it's not even she can't bathe herself. She's physically capable of bathing herself. She just won't. Yeah, this whole relationship is she needs her boy and this is his identity, is I take care of her. Yeah. It's not very healthy. He also has a really deep need for love and acceptance. Can we talk about the scene early on where he fantasizes that Murray calls him out of the audience. <laughs> and like gives him a hug. Yeah. That scene with Murray as like weird, creepy pseudo father figure. <laughs> you see all this, the lights, the show, the audience, all that stuff. I'd give it all up in a heartbeat to have a kid like you. It's brilliantly written. It's brilliantly played by both of them because in that scene, neither of them is winking at the camera. Yeah. Right? They're not like, I'm playing a scene right now. It's it's, it's so just, genuine. It's so genuine, which when you pop out of it, makes it even that much more disconcerting. Yeah. But like, this is what this guy thinks in his head. Yeah. Is real. And it's, man. But he craves so bad acceptance from a father figure because he never had that. Mm -hmm. He craves not acceptance, but also praise and kindness and support. And he wants a tribe. I mean, the whole movie, we're looking at him like, he doesn't fit in anywhere. He's trying to be playful with the kid on the bus because maybe I can connect with this person. And mom's like, would you please stop bothering my kid? Leave my kid alone. Mm -hmm. Anywhere he goes, he's, he can't even, with the, the clowns for hire, you would think if there's a safe place for, to not be bullied, if there's people who understand that you're a little unique, it's it would, clowns for hire. It would be clowns for hire. Yeah. And and there's the one guy who's kind to him. Hey, Alfred, I had a weapon. 
Sorry, mate. And everyone else treats him poorly. Yep. Right? Like, he doesn't have a tribe. He doesn't have a place to belong. And ultimately, that is part of what causes him to crack. There is so much film language and so much subtle detail going into making Arthur Fleck seem small and making him feel reduced and minimized in so many of the frames, especially anytime he's in the therapist's office. He is surrounded by clutter, yeah. which implies the clutter in his brain. Yeah, He is always framed down low in frames, so there's just tons and tons of headroom above him, which makes him feel small. Yeah, It's just small windows into his, his mindset. Um, he feels insignificant. And he dreams of, of being significant. And yeah. what a drab therapist's office, by the way. Oh, brilliant. The production design is fantastic. I mean, every single department on this movie was firing on all yeah. cylinders. The the score by Hildur Gudnestadter. I'm sorry, I don't speak Icelandic. Hildur Gudnestadter. The score is and you, haunting yes. and quiet and oftentimes weirdly atonal, and it gets inside his head in such a beautiful way, but then it also plays counterpoint to what's happening sometimes. And you compare it to other iterations of Joker music, like on Batman, the animated series, like and and in Batman, the Tim Burton one, there's it's also kind of this big orchestral circus, like it's kind fun. of clown circus. Yeah, it's clown, and, yeah. And, then, and then you go to Dark Knight, and it's just like unrelenting tension, like this razor tension, and that's... But with this film, like, if you hear there's an, an origin story about Joker, you do not expect this score. Not at all. And you don't expect it to be, you know, it was not only set in the 80s, it was filmed with a bunch of vintage lenses that yeah. are lower contrast. So blacks aren't black, they're raised up into the gray a little bit and whites aren't white, they're brought down a little bit, and it's just kind of mushy. And it felt like a grimy indie film from the from this MD, late 70s. And that was 80s. very, very specifically done. And the, the thing that was really interesting about that is the more he becomes the Joker, the higher contrast and the more saturated the colors get. Yeah. He becomes more aware of the world around him and sees it sharper, and there's more clarity for him. I know what I am now. Yeah. And life isn't so depressing. And if life isn't at it so depressing. It pops. There's color. There's life. Yeah. All I needed to do was start killing. This is not the message we want you to take from no. <laughs> our episode today. So how do we help him? Well, for the bipolar and for the pseudobulbar effect, there are medications okay. that can bring that, that chemical balance. What I would address as a family therapist is the need for him to do family therapy with his mommy. Sure. The fact that she let him be abused needs to come to light and needs to be dealt with. Yeah. Their codependent relationship, she needs to be more independent so he can be more independent because he's still in many ways a little boy. And he can't become a man until he is rid of her. And that's not the healthy way to go about it. I actually never recommend that in therapy, that you off your parents. I think it's better just to have better boundaries and healthier roles. I've learned something new. But that's just me. <laughs> Don't go all Oedipus. This is the first time he's hearing this. Yeah. So we need to address the codependency and, and, and disenmesh, right? Disentangle with healthier boundaries. But he actually needs a male therapist. And I would almost never say that. I don't really believe that gender matters as, with a therapist. Yeah, I, I think wouldn't. It's, it's skill, it's compassion, it's education that matters. But in Arthur's case, I would say he needs a male ther therapist because he so clearly needs a father figure. Arthur needs to experience something that we call transference which is where you take your feelings in therapy, you take your feelings for one person and you transfer them onto the therapist and then you work through things that way. So if Arthur has a male therapist, his desperate need for him, what he what he fantasizes about with Murray, you know, if I had a, I would give up my career and my fame to have a son like you. Arthur wants belonging, he wants support, he wants unconditional love and he wants it from a man. Yeah. Right? And so at least early on, I, I think it's, a, I would say it's a mistake, but I don't think the system had any... He's paired with a female therapist because this is what they got, right? right? And in her case, she's overworked, she's burnt out, and she shows all the signs of therapist burnout when he's like, You don't listen, do you? I don't think you ever really hear me. You just ask the same questions every week. And you might watch that and think, what a terrible therapist. But I watch her, I'm like, she probably started off pretty awesome. Yeah, I... 
I don't know a lot of people who go into therapy because they want to collect a paycheck and they don't care about people. Right. Because generally the pay is not that great. <laughs> right. Especially if you're working in, in the public field. So oh, yeah, she, she's she's underpaid. Sector. She's overworked. And she's probably burnt out. And the only time that she actually shows a real connection with him is when they're done. They don't give a shit about people like you, Arthur. And they really don't give a shit about people like me either. Right? She actually shows him empathy and compassion at that point. And what Arthur needed from his counselor, male or female, is he needed someone compassionate. He needed someone empathetic because that's what he was giving to the world and no one was meeting him there. Right. No one was meeting him there. And I don't fault the therapist, but I do say that is what he needed. Sure. And then finally, he needed group therapy. Arthur needs a tribe. He needs people who understand him, who don't judge him, who are going through similar things to what he's going through. Mm -hmm. And he needs to feel like it's okay to be him and that he is accepted, that he belongs. And that's part of why when he's on the cop car at the end, right? Like everyone's chanting his name. Like he's elated because he has a tribe. He has a tribe. Let's talk about the filmmaking of that moment and the performance and the, the choice to use the blood. <laughs> like, what do you think about all that? I mean, that's Arthur Fleck completely stepping into the Joker and just abandoning the Arthur Fleck persona, right? He's, he's gone. He's just, he's the Joker now. That's all he is. And the filmmaking of it is, <sighs> this movie is deeply uncomfortable because it gets you to empathize with a sociopath. It gets you to empathize with someone who is a villain. Uh, and that's not something we generally like to do. Yeah. Uh, and it gets you to empathize in such a deep way where you kind of get it and you kind of go, you're almost rooting for him a yeah. little bit. And then when he gets what he wants, it's triumphant and that's deeply uncomfortable. Yeah. And that's the filmmaking is all trying that you feel the, his the elation. score is big and brassy and we're winning and you feel his elation and he's lit up by a burning city but he's lit beautifully mm. and the crowd is chanting his name and it's so deeply uncomfortable brilliant film that i did not like <laughs> <laughs> yeah well it's not enjoyable but it, I, I appreciate it i loved it artistically i loved it but i didn't like it yeah Let's address, do you feel that the film glorifies the violence or the homicidal or the society, you, you get what you deserve, you know? Like, do you feel like it, it glorifies that? Because that was the fear, that was the controversy, right. right? And, I mean, obviously we both agree artistically it's incredible. What about the messaging of the film? You know, there was, there was obviously the controversy as it was coming out. Oh, this is going to incite rioting and, and whatever. And, A, that didn't happen, and B... It, it can't. This movie, it didn't glorify it. Yeah. It exposed it. Yeah. And exposure and glorification are two different things. And this showed you what it would feel like to be that person and glory in it. And it shows you that that's not a place you want to be. Yeah. It, it did such an effective job of making it hurt. Yeah to get there and making it hurt when you're there. Like he's standing on the car and he's gyrating and he's doing his thing and he feels great, but nothing's fixed, nothing's better. No, I mean, he's a figurehead. He doesn't truly have love. These people don't know him, right? Right. And it only feels triumphant because his life was so sad before, Yeah. but he's still got a lifetime in prison. Or if we're going with Batman canon, he's gonna escape and do all sorts of criminal mastermind things, but his life isn't a happy life, No. right? And so I, my, my takeaway from the film is not that we create our own monsters, because the fact is mental illness does not cause violence, right? The Columbine people, the guy who shot up the movie theater, mental illness played a factor in how they saw the world. They still made a choice yeah. to use this as a solution. But what I think we do need to see is we need to have compassion for people who are suffering and even people who've done terrible things, and this is where I come in as a therapist, I've done therapy with people who've done terrible things, and I have to dig deep and still find the person there. That behind most people who've done awful things is a person who's hurting. And a lot of times we can prevent it by showing them love and compassion. Well, and I would say that with this version of the Joker, the Arthur Fleck Joker, the tendency to violence was there. That was inherent in the person. But the 
lack of treatment for mental illness, the lack of compassion to him from everyone else around him is yeah. what drove him to violence. He may have been a powder keg on his own, but we lit the match. Exactly. Yeah, that's fair. So until next time, we used to think our show was a tragedy, but now we know it's a comedy. <laughs> and watch, watch movies. movies. <laughs>